I always remember to stand up when I'm having this put on, um, whenever I'm going to have something like this put on. And the reason I do is because of something I observed several years ago. Um, it was right at the time when Lou Gerstner took over IBM. Remember that? You know, IBM was in deep trouble, and they went out and hired a new CEO, and they hired Lou Gerstner. And it was Lou Gerstner's first visit to Rochester, which is where I'm located. And we were in the auditorium, and, and he was sitting in an um, end row seat, and I was sitting behind him. I was in the row behind him. And people came over to this end row seat with one of these kind of things, right? And they hooked him up while he was sitting down, you know, as other speakers were sort of introducing him and things like that, right? And it became his turn to speak, and so he stood up to get up on the stage and speak, and his pants pulled off. <laughs> and by the way, they were videotaping it. Okay? Um, for a period of time, you could actually go... He laughed about it. He thought it was really funny, right? Because somehow this, you know, this cord gotten tied into the, the seat that he was in, and so when he got up and it was hooked to his belt, he pulled his pants down, right? Well, so there was some scrambling to get the guy's pants back on and everything like that. And he was up on stage laughing and laughing about it, right? And you could actually go and see the video, and you could actually see his pants falling down. But after a very short period of time, like a couple of weeks, somebody in IBM thought that was not something that you should show, you know, Chief executive with his pants falling down, probably, you know, not a real good image, whatever it is. And they eliminated that from the, from the videotape. But it reminded me, don't have one of these things hooked on when you're sitting down, right? So, anyway. All right. Um, my role this morning is, um, as Trevor mentioned, I'm in charge of reminiscing. <laughs> right? I mean, it's one of the things we're going to do, right? We're supposed to do this, right? And the title they gave me is, well, it disappeared up there. Um, IBM I designed for the cloud. I'll think about that for a couple of minutes, right? You saw the history of all of our systems, right, going way back. Um, the base that we built years and years ago was first delivered in the System 38. Now, one of the points that I always like to make is that you have to have a very robust, very strong base to be able to build on top of that. And so one of the advantages we've had over the years is we've had this very strong base, right? But if in 1978 we introduced the first one that used this base system, namely the System 38, how many people were doing cloud computing during the 1970s? Because that's obviously when the system was designed, right? Okay? So, IBM I designed for the cloud is absolutely absurd. It couldn't have been. There was no such thing as a cloud. Okay? Right? But one of the things that's always interesting in this industry is everybody says they were designed for the cloud. Have you noticed that? Right? You know, what do most cloud systems, you know, public clouds and so forth, what operating system do they run today? Anybody know? What do they have? What? Some form of, Luna, of, of Unix, right? Generally Linux, but it's Unix, right? Okay. Well, when was Unix invented? Well, it was invented in the 1960s. It was for engineering. It was a single-user workstation. There was no concept of having multiple users. There was certainly no concept of a cloud, right? Nothing. It was designed as a very, very simple operating system. In fact, the real benefit of Unix is it's incredibly simple, right? But one of the real disadvantages is it's incredibly simple. Everything has to be built on top of it, right? So you're starting with a fairly weak base and piling a lot of things on top of it over the years, all right? But clearly, it was never designed for the cloud because it was done in the 1960s. Well, what else is out there? Well, IBM mainframe. I mean, you can put a mainframe in the cloud. We know that was designed for the cloud, right? Because that was designed in the early 1960s, announced back in 1964, right? What kind of computing do people do in the early 1960s? Obviously, cloud computing and internet computing, and, you know, right? Yeah, they did batch. You didn't even have a terminal attached to the system back in those days, right? I mean, everything was batch, 
whether you use tapes or punch cards or whatever the devil you had in those days, right? It was batch processing. The mainframe was designed to do batch processing. How do you measure performance on a mainframe? Does anybody know? I mean, when you want to compare one model to another? MIPS. What does MIPS stand for? Meaningless information, whatever, something. <laughs> right? It is. <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to be a measure of performance of speed, right? How many million instructions per second you can execute. And originally, that's what it was, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, that's good for, ba for batch processing. Because what you want to know when you can do batch processing is I want this system to be running just as fast as it can. And so I want something with a large MIPS value, if you will. Now, over a period of years, they actually modified what MIPS stood for, and it was really a relative performance measure between various systems. So if you bought yourself you know, a new uh, mainframe today, you could compare it with models in the past by looking at the MIPS number. But again, it's batch computing, right? They didn't ever think about even having a terminal attached to it. It was strictly a batch. Okay, so that kills those two off. Um, what other operating system is out there? Uh, there, well, there's another one, isn't there? Um, gosh, what's the name of it? You know, it's the one that you know, was a total disaster a couple of years ago. I think they called it Vista or something. Anybody remember that one? Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, they, uh, they fixed it over years. You know, I was one of those, you know, I mean, we were all using XP when I was back in IBM. Um, by the way, I am retired from IBM, six years retired. It's wonderful, right? As my wife says, now I only work six days a week. Um, we all used XP, and they came along with Vista, and of course I was you know, interested in it, and so you know, I had a system at home with Windows, because we were forced to use Windows in those days. And so I got a Vista, right? You know, this huge disaster called Vista. I ended up giving the system to one of my kids or something like that, right? And they didn't know any better, so we gave it to them. Well, the good news is Microsoft did fix it. They ended up with Windows 7, and the whole world moved to Windows 7, right? And now they've come out with another sensational operating system called Windows 8, otherwise known as Vista Plus. Right? Disaster again. You'd think they could kind of fix it, right? Things like that, right? So the world is expecting, like, Windows 9 will fix it. But of course, Microsoft isn't real sure, so they're going to skip 9, they're going right to 10. <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. Windows, Windows. Windows was designed for the cloud. It's new, it's modern, right? We all know that. You want to upgrade, you upgrade to this new modern Windows operating system, right? Hmm. Well, back in the 1960s, there was another company, Digital Equipment. And in fact, I was in school at the time, and I always remember the PDP machines and the deck vaxes and so forth. I mean, universities all over you know, handled those things. And they all ran a VMS operating system, so-called VMS. And VMS was very much like Unix, in a sense. It was sort of their interpretation of Unix in those days. It was a very simple, very low-level operating system. And um, it was designed for a single-user workstation. Again, usually an engineering scientific workstation. And over the years, you know, they enhanced VMS for a period of years. And somewhere in the late 1980s, Digital equipment decided that BMS could really not be enhanced anymore. Um, they had pushed it to up to a 32-bit operating system. They were not going to be able to get it to 64 bits. The base wasn't robust enough to be able to do that. And they decided they were going to just wipe it out, eliminate it, get rid of it, right? And so any users that were using that in those days uh, you know, were sort of notified, well, this is it, end of life for this particular system. VAX is going away, VMS is going away, and we're going to move to a new modern operating system known as Unix. Okay? Yeah. Well, one of the things that happened at that time is two companies were working on a new operating system. The two companies were Microsoft and IBM. Within Microsoft in the 1980s, they had DOS, right? And sitting on top of DOS was a thin application layer they called Windows but it was not a robust operating system. And Microsoft needed a new 32-bit operating system, whatever that was going to be. And so one of the things they decided to do is they decided to work with somebody, right, 
And they couldn't exactly work with digital because digital was abandoning theirs, right? So they decided to approach IBM. And they did, and IBM said, well, we're working on this new thing, which is going to be called OS2. Does anybody here remember OS2? Yeah, okay. All right, what happened to OS2? If we had another couple of hours, I'd explain to you, oh, IBM's really screwed that one up, but we don't. So, yeah, but they were working on it together. OS2 was going to be designed and developed jointly by Microsoft and IBM. Now, think about that for a minute. How about the two environments of the two companies? I mean, you know, you can picture the IBM people, you know, kind of the, you know, white shirt ties, you know, stiff upper lip, you know, whatever. You suppose that matched the Microsoft developers? <laughs> yeah. Do you suppose that the procedures and the structure that IBM put in place, we do this test, then this test, then this test, right? You suppose that matched Microsoft? Nah, not at all. It was a disaster, absolute disaster. They didn't work together at all, right? And so in the early 90s, I forget exactly what it was, I think it was in 1991 specifically, Bill Gates came to IBM. And he says, I've got a deal for you. He says, you, IBM, give me OS2. I will complete it. We'll give it a name of Windows of some kind or another, whatever it'll be, right? And in exchange for that, IBM, I will give you half ownership in every Windows product today and in the future. Okay? Now, I was sitting in Austin, Texas at the time. I had been asked to lead a team to design 64-bit power processor technology is what it amounted to. In those days, 32-bit power existed, but it was more for engineering scientific. We wanted to be able to use it in business computing, so I got the assignment to lead a team from across IBM to come up with essentially the architecture in today's Power 8. All right? And so I was sitting in Austin, Texas at the time because, um, well, let's put it this way, it was a joint effort between folks in Austin and folks in Rochester. And there's certain times of year in Rochester, Minnesota when it gets cold and we get this white stuff on the ground, you know, right? You're familiar with that here. I mean, you know, we get the same thing. We've also got it there today. And so when the weather turned cold, we moved all our meetings to Austin, Texas. And some of the people that we had in this group that I was leading were from OS2 because we wanted to ensure that all of IBM's operating systems could run on this new power platform and so forth. And they were kind of nervous about the whole thing because, you know, here's Bill Gates coming in saying, you know, give Microsoft OS2. And so, you know, what did that mean for them? It meant, you know, they lost working on it. So I'm sitting there and we hear about it and we're sort of, you know, chatting among ourselves thinking, well, what would the decision be? Well, let me reverse it for a minute. Okay, you, you are in charge in IBM of OS2, and Bill Gates comes to you and makes this offer to you. What would you do? It would take me about three nanoseconds to take it, right? I mean, you, you can't lose on something like that. Half ownership in all Windows products, right? Yeah, we wouldn't have an OS2. It would be running Windows, but today, right, you'd own half of all Windows, right? Nice thing. Well, what do you suppose IBM did? Well, I guess you know what IBM did. No way, right? We're IBM. We can do it better than anybody else, right? And a couple of years later, the OS 2. Well, now, all of a sudden, Microsoft, you'll see where I'm going with this, Microsoft was out of an operating system, right? When IBM said no, they didn't have a new operating system, right? So they managed to acquire, that's a polite way of saying, they, they basically stole it, but don't say that, right? Um, they hired away all the VMS people because the VMS people no longer had a job because, remember, digital decided to go with Unix, right? So they hired the entire team that developed the VMS operating system, moved them to Redmond, Washington, and they created a so-called new operating system. And in fact, they took the VMS operating system, the letters VMS, they added one letter in the alphabet to it because it was the next generation. It came up WNT and they announced it as Windows NT. 
And when the original version of Windows NT blew up, you know, blue screen the sort of thing, it put up VMS error messages, which kind of was an indication it was really VMS. There was a big battle between digital and Microsoft. Microsoft managed to convince digital this was a good thing, and digital signed over VMS to Microsoft. Microsoft today owns the VMS operating system. It's the basis for today's Windows. So my point is, it comes from the 1960s also, all right? So the newest operating system out there is this thing we call IBM I. But still, it couldn't have possibly been designed for the cloud because nobody was doing cloud computing during the 1970s. Hmm, you think they're coming through the ceiling? Is that what we, could be. Well, let me tell you, it was designed for the cloud because most of us believe that cloud computing was the direction in those days. And let me explain it. During the 1960s in particular, and into the 1970s, there was a ton of money being poured into universities, research facilities, and so forth by the government. Remember in those days, I mean, certainly the US government was spending an awful lot of money on various research projects. In fact, it was kind of a, a, a peak, if you will, in all of the research activity that was going on in computer systems. Really occurred during the late 1960s into the early 70s. There were a lot of people looking at various new operating systems, new hardware, all kinds of things. There was also the space program, right? And clearly, NASA was pouring a lot of money into a lot of these organizations. In fact, I went back, I went to work for IBM took a leave of absence and went back to school, and NASA paid for it. I had a NASA fellowship, National Aeronautics and Space Administration fellowship, which paid all my expenses and my living expenses. And, you know, I wish such a thing was available today, right? But a lot of people have asked me, he says, wait a minute, why, why did the National Aeronautics and Space Administration send me to school? Well, because in the, the space race in particular, you need new computers. And I was in a position where I was actually studying new computer technology. And so even though I had no intention and no, certainly no commitment to go to work for them, I was going back to work for IBM, they wanted to expand the study of computer systems, right? So there was a lot of things going on in those days, right? And in fact, one of the things that was happening is the, the government was supplying massively big computer systems to almost any university, big university that had research projects going on in advanced computer technology, right? And so many of the major universities in the U.S. all went to the, the federal government, in fact, mostly to the, the defense agency, and said, we're studying all of this stuff, and we need some really big new computers. And the government was providing all these fancy new computers. And of course, every university wanted the biggest fanciest thing out there, right? They wanted the biggest supercomputers. By the way, supercomputers came out of the 1960s and, you know, for various kinds of research activities. And somebody in the U.S. government said, wait a minute, <clears throat> why does every single university need every type of computer system? You know, why, why do we have to put the biggest and the best in every university? What would happen if in a particular university, let's say we put in a, a supercomputer that's numeric intensive computing, you know, whatever it happens to be, and in another one we put in the computer systems that are optimized for graphical act activities and so forth. Another one we put a different kind in. And what if we get a system where they can all share those? Because by that time, of course, people were starting to attach terminals to these things. So why can't I at a university sit down at a terminal, right, and I can deal with my own university computer systems, tie into each one of those, but why can't I tie into a computer system that's sitting at some, somebody else's university? I should be able to do that, right? And so they started a project to say, let's do that. Let's, let's start tying these together. And of course, one of the problems they had in those days is communication speed, right? Everything was really kind of slow in those days. You know, how do you tie them together? And so there was a lot of effort over a period of a few years there to come up with what's the absolute best way to be able to, on a communication basis, link these various computers together. And they really came up with an idea called packet switching. And, you know, it's I'm not going to bother to talk too much about packet switching, but that was the mechanism they came up with. 
And one of the other things they wanted is to make sure that you could tie these various computer systems at different universities, any place in the country, or for that matter, any place in the world. You wanted to tie them together not just with a single link, you wanted multiple ways to it, right? And that was somewhat the defense department. They said, you know, what happens if you know, one of these blows up or something? We want to be able to get at all of these things. And they linked it all together in the network. And they gave that network a name. They called the network the ARPA network. Yes. And it came out in the early 1970s with the ARPA network. And it was really a network between universities, research laboratories, and so forth. It was very, very you know, tight-knit from that standpoint. <coughs> Ten years later, it morphed into something else. What did it morph into? The internet. That's what it is, right? And so if you were sitting back there in the early 70s, even the late 60s, you said, aha, that's the future, right? You know, businesses are going to be able to do this too, right? I mean, why should it just be research laboratories? I should be able to run applications in a lot of different computer systems and Maybe I'm renting time. There was something in the 60s known as Service Bureau. If you're a really small business and couldn't afford your own computer, you actually rented time on a system that somebody had from a Service Bureau. But if you're big enough to have your own computer system, that's fine. That was what Rochester, Minnesota was in the business of doing for small and mid-sized businesses. And you could be using your computer system. But by the way, if you needed something additional, uh, you needed more, you know, more memory capacity or different types of computing, Maybe you rent some of that kind of time. Or maybe you have multiple computer systems in your business, and you can tie between those different systems. So that's, what do we call that today? I think we call it a cloud, right? So we designed the initial System 38, the base of today's IBM I, for that kind of computing. So you might ask yourself, well, how do you do that? Okay, well. Multiple things. One of the first things you want to be able to do is you want to make sure that you can do transaction processing, right? Because most of what you're going to be doing if you're sending something off is going to be some limited transaction. It's not going to be batch computing, right? And so you optimize the system for transaction processing. Now, how did the rest of the world, because the rest of the world had to do the same transaction processing, how did they do it? Well, go back to the mainframe. Mainframe was designed for batch computing, right? All of a sudden, people wanted to attach terminals to it. They wanted to do transaction computing. How do you solve that on a mainframe? Well, the answer is you put a chunk of software on it, right? Anybody remember CICS? What was CICS? It was a transaction processor. That's what, what it was, right? How about a database? Gee, we'd like to have a database. How about an IMS database was the first one. IMS database is a transaction-oriented database. Again, a piece of software that's sitting on the top there, right? The Unix folks had to do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Some of us looked at it and said, that's not very efficient. Because you know, you've got this base system that's designed to do batch processing, mainframe, if I looked at that, which was the only other IBM system that I really could look at. I said, the mainframe is designed for batch processing, and it's got this chunk of software on top of it to do transaction processing. That's not terribly efficient. Is there a better, more efficient way of doing transaction processing? Right? And some of the work that I had done earlier in university uh, really was based on that premise that the way the mainframe actually implemented something they originally called virtual memory was wrong. Okay? And it was really the way they implemented virtual memory that was causing the problems with transaction processing. Okay? Now, without boring you too much and without running too far over on my time here, um, the whole concept of virtual memory is, you know, it's sort of pretend memory. And when it was originally, you know, proposed by some folks back in the early 60s, they said you should take all memory, right? Your, your main memory, your disk memory, your tapes, your, you know, drum memory, whatever you happen to have, everything, just put it all in one giant address space. And from a programming standpoint, you just address it, right? You don't worry about moving things around. You don't worry about different you know, protocols on these things. You just address it. And so what happened when the mainframe implemented virtual memory, they said, well, we can't afford a big, big address and address everything, so we'll take a little piece of it. And so they said, we'll take 16 megabytes, 16 megabytes of 
disk storage, and we'll say that's the virtual memory. Now, even in those days, any of the mid and larger mainframes had far more memory. But 16 megabytes is all they could address. They had a 24-bit address. That was the maximum they had, right? And so the idea behind it is if you're dealing with virtual memory, you're dealing with that 16 megabytes. If you want to go outside of that, you have to literally go outside of that, right? And one of the things that happens is when you switched from one user to another, remember we're talking about multi-user systems, you had to make sure that you cleaned out all the translation tables for that virtual memory. You had to reload a lot of address registers. There were a lot of things that you ended up having to do, right? Well, we came up with a concept called single level store. And single level store solved the problem. And let me tell you a quick story to illustrate the point. We were getting ready to announce the System 38. It was going to be announced in 1978, right, end of the 70s. In 1977, IBM sent out, or actually we sent out, to all IBM locations detailed specifications of this new system. And it was something that IBM did with all new products, uh, primarily because it was, a, it was essentially a peer review. You know, we're asking all these other laboratories around the, around the country, around the world for the, in the, those days, um, to take a look at the specifications of this new product, sort of critique it. You know, is there anything you know, that should be changed, whatever, before it's announced, and so forth. And normally, those were kind of boring things. I mean, you'd receive them, you kind of look at it, say, oh, yeah, ho well, hum, it's just more of the same, right? No big deal. Well, this one was a little strange, and there were some other laboratories, specifically Poughkeepsie, New York, which is our, our big mainframe shop, and uh, Yorktown Heights, which is IBM Research. Both of them looked at these specifications for what was going to become the System 38, and they went ballistic. They said, this is crazy. This will never work. These people live in a cornfield in Minnesota. They've never really built a computer. They don't know what it is. What is wrong with these idiots that put something like that? This will embarrass IBM to no end because nobody, but nobody, builds computers this way. We had, in 1977, the biggest audit we had ever seen, technical audit. We had a warehouse building being built at the time. It was, you know, one of these big open buildings, the cement floor, the high ceilings, you know, that, you know, just big open, went on forever kind of thing, right? One of our, would become a manufacturing building at some point. Um, Took, that, took over that, put in some metal tables. I don't know where they found metal tables, but they made a lot of noise. Bunch of metal chairs invited in all the top technical people in computer systems within IBM to Rochester to spend two weeks in an audit going step by step by step through the design of this crazy new system because they were convinced it would not work. It was impossible. And I remember one of the days I was presenting some performance numbers because we had done a lot of simulation, you know, so forth, what, what our performance was going to be. And one of the comments I had, and I used charts in those days, by the way, and one of the things I had in the charts is how many instructions we executed before we switched users. You know, because again, it's a multi-user system, and the idea behind it is, you know, we were building single processors in those days, so we only had one processor. And so the idea behind it is that, you know, I would work on, you know, on, on your program, right? And I would execute so many instructions. Then I would switch to your program, execute so many, I'd switch to yours, execute so many, eventually get back to you, right? And so I could continue to do what we call time sharing really in those days, right? And I had on my chart, it said, we a average execution is about 1,000 instructions before we switch users, okay? 1,000 instructions, right? A couple of people jumped up on the audit team, said, whoa, there's your problem. What do you mean there's your problem? He says, you're only executing 1,000 instructions before you switch. Yeah, so what? I said, well, do you realize the mainframe, in order to switch from one user to the another, executes 1,000 instructions? And the answer is yes. I knew that, right? So it says, well, if you take 1,000 instructions to switch users, and then you only execute 1,000 instructions before you switch again, you're getting 50% of the performance out of the machine, right? Because you're spending all your time switching. At which point I said, well, we don't execute 1,000 instructions to switch users. 
And they said, well, how many do you execute? One. Have you ever had one of those experiences, right, where, you know, you're standing in front of a group and you say something that kind of hits them and you realize that for about two seconds the world has stood still? I mean, these people have lost two seconds out of their life, right? You know, it's just kind of like, you know, whatever, right? Yeah, that was, it was, what do you mean one? One, we execute one. What's that instruction? Branch. In single level store, you just branch to it, right? Because you don't reuse the addresses, right? It's all unreusable, right? It really, single level store was great because you could plug in different types of storage and it took it over, you know, all four of you did all the, the work for you. You didn't need a database administrator. I mean, we've seen a lot of the advantages of single level store. But the one that you know, we hadn't really emphasized much is that it's really designed for transaction processing, right? And it truly is, right? Think about some of the early models of, you know, pick any, any particular model over the years, right? It was a great transaction processing system. You know, we used to talk about it as being interactive or, you know, different names that we used over the years, right? But then you would suddenly put a batch job on it, and what happened? It kind of went, Ugh, right? Because it never really had a lot of horsepower. It never really had a lot of MIPS, you know, if you will, right? It was never designed for batch. It was really designed for transaction processing, right? Well, we got, you know, there was a lot of buzzing after this one and branch, and it says, ah, you got a problem, you got a problem. Okay, what's my problem? Anybody can branch anybody else's code or anybody else's data, right? I mean, it's just one big address space. You can go anywhere. Well, no, you can't, right? Because we have this thing called objects, right? We package everything in an object. Why do we package it in an object? To prevent people from going everywhere, right? It's a security issue, okay? And um, where did the idea of objects come from? Well, I had to... Um, when I was working on single-level store at the university, I had to come up with a simulation of a computer system. And, of course, I picked an IBM computer system, of course. And uh, I found a simulation that was developed at Stanford University. In fact, there was kind of the hotbed of things were going on around that area at the time that really became Silicon Valley, right, which is where most creativity happens even today. Um, and I became fascinated with how people did simulation languages. Uh, there was a language known as SimScript. And it was a very popular one at the time where you could simulate a whole computer system. And the idea behind it is if there was some part of the computer system, you really didn't care about the details of it. You just said it had to be there for completeness. All you had to do is, is put it into literally a blob, right? And identify if you give it a certain input, here's the output that you expect to come out of the thing, right? Well, that blob, they called an object, right? And a couple of years after I was playing with SimScript, they did a little bit of a modification, reintroduced it to the world as Smalltalk. It was the first object-oriented language. But it was a wonderful way of separating these things. Okay? And so we put everything into objects. And we also protected every one of those objects, right? By saying, okay, you have authority to this particular object. By the way, here's a program object. You know, it's not data. You can't introduce data, turn it into a program, and so forth. And all of that is because everything's sitting in this one big address space, right? We also said another way to protect this thing, because after all, we're building business computers, and business computers have to last for a long, long time, which was one of those things hammered into me by management in Rochester, is it said the most important thing in a business from the standpoint of computing is the applications and the data. It's not the operating system, it's not the hardware, it's their applications, because that's what's running their business, right? So if you want to be able to protect the innards of the whole thing, and make changes inside, you've got to find some way to protect that. And that really was the concept of a high-level interface, right? Which we call technology-independent machine interface. And during the time period that I'm talking about here, there was a lot of effort to come up with high-level language computers. In other words, it would execute one and only one language, right? And in fact, at the university where I was attending, there was a design going on for a, a machine called Symbol, was the name of it. It was called Symbol. And it was a project that was joint between the university and a company on the West Coast in uh, Silicon Valley uh, called um, Fairchild Semiconductor. 
and Fairchild Semiconductor was trying to build a high-level machine which had its own language. They called it the symbol programming language, SPL. They created a new language for it. And they were working on this, and their intention was actually to use it and sell it as a competitor to IBM. Well, it turned out there were some internal battles going on, et cetera, et cetera, at Fairchild Semiconductor, and they killed the project. Um, there were two lead engineers running this thing, and in fact, there were a couple of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductor, and they broke off, and they said, you know, enough of this, I'm not going to work here anymore. They went off and they formed a new company of their own. It was a small company. Uh, they scrambled a little bit to find what the name they should call it, but they finally settled on the name Intel. Okay, the founders of Intel actually were leading this symbol project. By the way, when, when Fairchild Semiconductor found out I, as a student, was still on leave of absence for IBM, they wouldn't let me work on Symbol. So I felt free to steal anything from it, right? So we ended up with a you know, high-level interface. By the way, in um, the early 1980s, the very first 32-bit chip to come out of Intel was something called a 486 chip. And a lot of people said it's a system 38 on a chip. It was a high-level interface to the chip, right? Again, because the two founders of Intel actually were leading this team back <laughs> called Symbol, right? Whatever. So we got this high-level interface. The other nice thing about it is you can't see what's down below it, right? So if you're going to hack into it, you don't know what's there. A few years ago, our mainframe did the same thing. They kind of closed off the internals. If you want to hack a Unix system, you have the source code of the operating system. There's nothing to it. A couple of years ago, I was in Malaysia, and I was speaking to a user group, and I felt kind of bad in a sense because, I mean, I love to speak to user groups, but down the hall there was another conference going on, and I really wanted to go attend that conference because it was called How to Hack the Cloud. And it was a step-by-step -step, because I talked to some people that attended it. Here's how you do it. Do, do, do. You know, we see these movies of some very sophisticated hackers, right? You know, I mean, the, the typical, typical Hollywood movie, they're seeing they're hacking away, right? You know, and, oh, I just broke into whatever it is. And then, of course, when the news comes out, it's some 12-year-old kid in his family's basement, right, who hacked in and stole all this, right? There is no Unix system, no Windows system that cannot be hacked. Nothing to it. IBM I, never been hacked. Absolutely never been hacked. Anybody had a virus on your IBM I? No such thing, right? It's designed for the cloud. That's really what it's all about. Now, the point of this whole thing is I'm talking about, you remember I'm the reminiscing guy? You know, I get to reminisce, right? We're not building that System 38 today, right? But we are using the same base. We're using the same concepts in it, right? And one of the real advantages that we have with IBM is we have this robust base that we can build on. And over the years, we built a lot on top of this thing, right? We also never really admitted in the early days that it was an operating system. When you bought a System 38, you bought an AS400, you bought an IBM uh, i-series, or whatever you call those things, what IBM was selling you was this box, right? And so we all thought, oh, well, what I'm buying is this box. No, what you're really buying is a piece of software because this thing runs as a virtual machine. It runs on top of this technology independent machine interface. The entire system is designed in software. It's not designed in hardware at all, right? And so all of a sudden, when we wanted to put it on power systems, uh, we said, well, we've got a problem here because now we have to confess to the world that it really has been an operating system all these years, right? So we talk about it as power systems running the operating system, IBM I. And I find customers all over the world saying, you took our system away and gave us just an operating system. Well, sorry, that's all it was in the first place, right? But now at least it's on power systems, which you know, gives us a huge amount of uh, benefit there. So. so if we look at the whole thing, and you ask IBM if you've got a business system and you want to run it on power, and by the way, IBM doesn't support uh, x86 anymore. I mean, I, I suspect that Allison will talk a little bit about this. Um, we got rid of all the Intel stuff, and it's now power, and we're starting to find more and more customers, uh, businesses, governments, and so forth out there that are standardizing on power. It's the base to be on. And we've got this robust base 
that was originally developed years and years ago, whereas the rest of them are sitting on this flaky little, you know, be it Unix or whatever. So it, it's the best cloud computing system. It really is. And somehow we've got to get more and more of that message out. Okay? Well, with that, I uh, think I'm going to turn it over to somebody. I'm not sure who. Who do I give it to? Anybody ready back there? We're having a break. We're having, oh, break. It's better. All right. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>